Hello everyone, this is Experiment Design in Computer Science, Week 7, Sample Sizes. In this first video, I will address some uh, schedule notifications about the lecture and I will also talk about the comments from last week. So let's get started. Oops. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is the dates, the deadlines for report two. Many people have asked. These deadlines were already written in the in Manaba. So please, uh, if you have any questions, make sure to check the materials uh, in Manaba. So first, the six, uh, I, I did some delay. So the first and the second deadlines, I gave one more week for everyone. The first is the submission of the report topic on 4th of June. So for the report topic, just like in the first report, you only have to submit your general idea and I will give you some feedback about your idea depending on what you write. Okay, so the first one will not be graded. You just re submit your report idea so that I can give you some feedback. Then uh, you have to submit a presentation, as I mentioned in the first lecture. Because we have more students than I expected, usually we have around 20 students, but now we have like 35 students, it will not be possible to have everyone do the presentation. So what we will do instead is that you will make a video with five minutes of your presentation and you will submit your video on streams and send me the link. Uh, you send me the link through Manaba and the deadline for the video link is June 25. So it's one week later than the regular. So I'll give you one extra week to account for this, um, the preparation of the video. And finally, uh, the report submission will be on July 2nd, and this is the same deadline as in the beginning, okay? So you report, the f you submit the final report on J July 2nd. The, you can go to reports and you can see that these reports are already open, so you can see the details of the reports. There's also a small uh, change in the class schedule. So, uh, next week, uh, so it was this week to be uh, case studies and next week to be sample size. We are going to do the opposite. This week is sample size and next week is case studies. Okay. On June 11, we're going to have a discussion on the report. So the discussion on the report is a space for you to ask questions about how to write the report and for me to give you some recommendations on your report. And then on June 6, uh, 6 uh, 18th, I'm going to do a final rev revision of the course. So I will give an overview of the material that we had on this course uh, so that you can prepare yourself for the exam and also prepare yourself for the um, for the final report. And the final exam will be on um, June 25th. And the final exam will be online uh, for everyone at the same time. It will be at the time of the um, class uh, office, office hours. Okay, I will send a message later with the exact time and how will be executed the, the, examina the final examination. Now, uh, we had the time zones for everyone and uh, most of the people are in the Japan time zones. We had about three people in the GMT plus eight Chinese time zone. Um, I think Southeast Asia is also on GMT plus eight. I'm not sure about Indonesia. Anyway, we have one person on GMT plus seven time zone and we had two people on GMT plus six time zone. So everyone could make it to the um, lecture um, office hours. It would be a little bit earlier for some people, but it will be still be afternoon for everyone. <clears throat> Then I asked the two questions about the topics. What is alpha correction and what do you do with outliers? And this time, most everyone had some very good answers. Um, the general answer, the, the, I mean, there are variations. This is not the only possible answer, but the general idea of the answer is that alpha correction is when we reduce the value of alpha 
compared to the value that we desire for our experiment. And we do this reduction to avoid type error one inflation, which is what happens when you do multiple comparisons. Most of the people got this correctly. A few people answered what it is for. So it said, oh, it's to reduce uh, the inflation, type one inflation for multiple comparisons. But you did not answer what it is. So please pay attention to the questions, okay? Pay attention to the questions and make sure that you are answering what the question is asking. Um, also, I had a few people that copied answers. One person copied answers from the slides. Another person copied answers from another uh, book. And it's really obvious. It's really easy to see when you are copying the answer. And if you copy the answer, uh, all that's going to happen is that you are not going to learn. If you are not interested in learning, why are you taking this course? You are a master's student. This is not undergraduate. Um, you have many different courses that you can take. So um, think of this course as an opportunity for you to learn more. If you are just copying answers, uh, you are not learning. So you are, you are the only person that's going to be penalized for losing an opportunity to learn. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so the second question was, uh, what should we do with big outliers? Uh, very simplified. Again, most of the people uh, answered correctly. Uh, we had a few people that answered incorrectly. And the, gen the general answer is that we should invest. The first thing that we should do when we see outliers in our result is to investigate the outliers, because the outliers could be because of an error in the experiment, or they could be some special issue that we are not aware before. So if the outliers were simply because of an error, like maybe someone wrote one extra zero when it was not necessary, or maybe the computer uh, shut down in the middle of the experiment. If that's that's very, very simple error, then of course you should remove the outliers. But if the outliers are not because of an error, but because they are a characteristic, then you have to consider if you are going to use the outliers, if the outliers are outside of your um, experiment, um, if you should do use maybe a more robust technique that uh, would take into account the influence of your outliers, okay? So that's the general idea. Anyone that gave an answer like this, the general idea is like, if you see outliers, it's probably something important and you should analyze them. Uh, again, in this question too, we had some people that just copied what was written in the slides. And I mean, I'm not going to grade these answers, but the idea is that you study and you answer so that you can, by answering the questions, you can improve your understanding. If you just copy the results, then you are not really uh, learning anything new. Okay, this time we had many questions from the students. Uh, I found it, uh, some of the questions were really good. So I'm going to read these questions here. I have also posted the questions on Manaba. So you can read the answers in Manaba as well. So the first question is, does the term assumption of normality means the assumption that the data we obtain should follow standard distribution. Yes, this is mostly correct. To be more precise, assumption of normality means that the data we are using on the test follows a normal distribution. Because some of the tests use the data, like the z-test use the data directly. But for instance, the ANOVA uses the residuals which is the difference between the data and the mean. Pair tests use the differences, right? The difference between the pairs. In that case, when we say um, assumption of normality, we're talking about the normality of the data that we are using to calculate the test statistic. So if it's the z-test, then it's just the data. If it's the ANOVA, then it's the residuals. If it's a pair test, we're talking about the differences, okay? Anyway, but yes, the, the, the data that we are using to calculate the test must follow a normal distribution. Okay. Now, a second question is when we use the student test or non-parametric test, when we obtain few data from the experiment, in the case where we have few data from the experiment, uh, see what I'm going to talk about in today's lecture. Okay. 
Someone asked, in the online examination, can we use handwritten notes and a dictionary? Is it allowed to refer to the materials of this course? So you can use handwritten notes, one A4 page, okay? And a dictionary, but you cannot use the materials of the course, okay? Prepare your handwritten notes. What's the difference between CLT, the central limit theorem, and bootstrapping? Is there a practical difference between this? That's a very good question. The CLT, the central limit theorem, is a theorem that states that sample means distributions tend to be normal when the, sam the size of the sample increases. Bootstrapping is a data transformation technique that uses the, TL the CLT. So the relation between the CLT and bootstrapping is that is a little bit like the CLT is a theory and bootstrapping is one of the techniques that you can use that is based on this theory. <coughs> if possible, I would like to know the example of report two from last year. Okay, I will get some examples from report two in next year and I will put them on Mana by next lecture. Please let me know the due date of the second report. I put that on the beginning of this and it is also on Manaba. So the topic is 6.4, just the idea. And then the presentation is 6.25, one week later than what was indicated in the first class. And the submission is 7.2, same deadline as was announced in the first class. Uh, I'm not sure about the beta value. Is it true that the beta value is inferable by alpha value? Not exactly. There is a relationship between alpha and beta, the power beta and the confidence alpha, because both of them depend on same things. So both alpha and beta depend on the sample size, both alpha and beta depend on the new hypothesis, and both alpha and beta depend on the, on the data. However, alpha depends only on the distribution for the new hypothesis, but beta depends on the difference between the assumed distribution of the new hypothesis and the real distribution of the data. And we don't know this. So it's not possible to infer beta only from alpha, okay? In slide number 24, you mentioned U follows roughly a normal distribution, but U and U prime is calculated by analyzing the whole sample and choose whichever is smaller to be U. So they are single values. Yes, that's correct. That's a very good question. Let me try to explain better what I mean when I say U follows roughly a normal distribution. Note that when I say U follows a normal distribution, what I mean is that if you had multiple samples from the same experiment, so let's say sample one, sample two, sample three, for each sample, you could calculate one U, U1, U2, U3. If you put all of these U's and you calculated the distribution of them, they would follow roughly a normal distribution. This is the same idea as this, uh, the, the mean sample mean. The sample mean is the same thing. When you calculate the mean of the sample, it's only one value. But if you take many samples from the same process and you calculate the mean of each sample, the mean will be slightly different, but we will still follow a normal distribution. Okay? So this is because the process that generates U can be taught as a random variable. So the process that we use to generate U from the data is a random variable. Okay, so here, compare the idea of U with the idea of sample mean. Can you explain the score of report one? So I gave the score of report one from zero to 10, okay? Depending on how much you satisfy the requirements of the report, you get a score from zero to 10. The total score of the course is given by report one times two, report two times four, and XM times four divided by 10, okay? The passing grade is six. That's the standard, the standard passing grade for Tsukuba. If you go to Manaba course information, uh, there will be like grading section that you can read to read all the details. I think in the grading section, I use a rating from zero to 100, not a zero from 10, but 
it's just you have just to make the calculation 0 from 10 0 to 100 is the same idea okay you need 60 percent of the grade to pass on the course and the weights are two for report one four for report two and four for report for the exam okay those were the questions for today thank you for the many questions and now we will go for the topic of the lecture see you there